Well, the most important thing about the San Francisco Traditional Jazz Archive here at Stanford University is the legacy that it, that it, it represents. The musicians who tirelessly dedicated their lives to it have been underappreciated in the world of music. The thing I always felt from the beginning of my association with the foundation, which goes back before Stanford, was how important it was that we had specifically a Turk Murphy's library. Because the Lou Waters arrangements, people have seen those. But the Murphy arrangements are, are have never really been seen by the public. Researchers will care about the Waters manuscripts and the, the Murphy manuscripts, and band leaders, musicians who like the music, to see how Lou and Turk envisioned a song being presented. You have the recordings, but there's some things they didn't record. But you can get an idea of how, how they intended it to sound just by looking at the music. Well, the archive was started in 1980s, around 1981 by Jim Goggin. He was the guy who founded the foundation and he was the first collector. His ultimate goal was to start a permanent collection somewhere that was focused on the legacy of Turk Murphy's jazz band. Over the years uh, after Turk passed away, we amassed a large collection. There were band arrangements, artifacts of all sorts, promotional materials, just a really eclectic mix of things. A lot of Turk Murphy's business records were one of the things that was interesting. The actual physical scrapbooks that were made in the 1930s and 40s by Turk Murphy. He had a notion that somebody would someday be going through his stuff, because his stuff is really quite well notated. His tapes are marked with personnel, his correspondence, he knew that people would be reading his letters. He kept the recording sessions going back to the 1940s. He knew that he was going to have a place in history, because often people who are interested in history hope that they will be part of it someday themselves. Having the Lou Waters and Turk Murphy manuscripts all in one place and the photo collection, uh, all of that's invaluable. And it's so nice to know it's all here and not scattered to the four winds. The early version of the Yerba Buena Band at the Dawn Club, they would play occasional tangos and waltzes, foxtrots, and pop tunes of the day. Clint actually found a photo in the archive that's usually cropped. It's the, the full band with the banjo and tuba and the KYA microphone in front. He found a, a larger copy of the print and you can see Ellis Horn playing tenor sax. So obviously they're not playing Come Back Sweet Papa or uh, Heebie Jeebies or something. That's got to be some kind of dance band tune. And I, th I think at some point Lou said, Let's just do this the right way. We either play the old repertoire or don't bother. San Francisco was the place the music prospered beyond Lou Waters. And this whole business spawned a whole variety of bands playing in the style, imitating to a, one degree or another what Waters had started. And Murphy reflected this and the people that Murphy inspired, continued to reflect this, and do to this day. This uh, spontaneous combustion and activity didn't occur to anything like this degree in other places in the country. It had something to do a little bit with the attitudes and atmosphere of the city itself. <laughs> This is a real treasure trove, and I'm, I'm so delighted to know it's all here and that I was able to help a little bit with it and uh, get the music out to people uh, who appreciate it and also hopefully to make some uh, new fans for this, this type of music who might not otherwise know about it.